lost all the time. You get to be with your brothers again, right? Oh, those smelly feet. So we've been looking at studying on the big series of what is the church. And we've talked about it a little bit. We're partway through. But we begin talking about what is the true church of God. And when we look at God's people throughout the word of God, God never looks for people that's mingled in with the world. But rather, he is drawing and constantly separating his people from the world. He brought Abraham out of the land of Ur, where his father was an idol maker, who worshipped other gods, made other gods, brought him out. He told them, come out from be them among them and be them separate. He said the same thing for the church. When it comes to um, the saints, we are sanctified ones, we are called out ones. We looked at the purpose of the church, and we looked at, and the purpose of the church was edification, education, and evangelizing. And I'm going a little bit all over the place. When we look at the church itself, do you remember who the chief cornerstone is? Jesus, Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. That cornerstone is the stone that gives the direction to every other stone that is laid after that, that forms the foundation, which angle it goes, which direction it goes, etc., etc. And who is the foundation after Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, but who is the foundation of the church? The prophets and the apostles. And from there, who builds upon the apostles and the prophets? You and I do. And when we look at the Bible, we are not just an organization like any other denomination or any other group out there. We're not like the Catholics were not like the Jehovah Witnesses, but rather the Bible describes us as lively stones. And the reason we're lively stones is because it's not just me going and inviting Brother Eli to church, but when I'm doing so, it's the Holy Ghost moving upon Eli and working upon him to try to woo him to church, to woo him to Christ. So when we look at the church, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. It is built upon the foundation, it is the apostles and the prophets, and then we make up the rest through the power of the Holy Ghost. We talked a little bit about the early church, um, how they had their pros, but they also had their cons. And how they might have been great, and we can look back there to some time, but I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to be uneducated. The Apostle Paul gave them a lot of instruction, and they had some growing up to do. And then last week, we started talking about the gifts that Christ gave to the church. If we would please read Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. In fact, that's at the top of your notes for this week as well. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And he gave some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And then we get a little bit more into 1 Corinthians 12, 28. If someone would go ahead and read that. First Corinthians 12, 28, it's right there at the top. So God gave gifts to the church. We found that listed in Ephesians 4, 11. We're building all upon, um, there's a New Testament verse, but we took the Old Testament verse of Psalm 68, 18 last week. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. And then we get down to it, when we look at the early church, really there wasn't a whole lot of leadership at first because there was no need for it. We had the apostles. But that does not mean that God did not have a plan in the first place. People already had callings in their life, and we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that God had called some and set some apart as apostles, and then he set some apart as prophets, 
and some teachers, miracles, helps, governments, and etc. When we look at the apostle, which is the first one listed, and we're going to be looking at that this week. When we look at the apostle, the title of apostle was first given to those hand-selected followers of Jesus Christ, such as Peter, James, and John. Would someone please read Luke chapter 6 and verse 13? Luke 6, 13. And when it was day, he called on his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So he chose twelve, and what did Jesus Christ title these men? Apostles. He titled them apostles. Now when we look at the title apostle, it's not only given in the scriptures to the first followers of Jesus Christ, but it's given to Jesus Christ himself. If someone would please read Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Hebrews 3 and verse 1. So Jesus Christ is also given the title of apostle. Now, my notes got a little bit shifted if we're going to make nice, clear, conscious, uh, nice, clean notes. But moving on to the next point, when we look at the title of apostle, we know that the names of the apostles are also written on the four square city in heaven. If someone would please read Revelation 21 and verse 14. And I'll take the next one, 1 Corinthians 12. But for Revelation 21 and verse 14. And the walls of the city have twelve foundations, and then the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So when we're looking at that name, title apostle is given, is a title given to Jesus Christ. It is a title given to those that were hand selected by Jesus Christ. And on top of that, the names of the apostles are written on the base, or the original 12, are written on the base of the four square city, that place that Christ has gone to prepare for those that worship him and serve him. And where he mentioned that there I go to prepare a place for you. The four square city is that place. And the foundation of it has the names of the apostles written on it. And when we get to the title or name apostle, it is a calling. It is not just another title. We live in a day and age where ministers love to give themselves all kinds of titles. Yeah, bishop so-and-so, bishop so-and-so, reverend so-and-so, or um, and the list goes on and on and on. But when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28 and 29, we discover that it is a calling. It is not just a title, but it is a calling. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28 and 29, the Bible reads, And God has set some in the church first, apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then the gifts of healing, helps, governance, diversity of tongues. And then he gets him to say, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of, of miracles? Well, when we look at this, Paul is making a distinction and saying, you know what? This is not just another title. If you're a helper, teacher, prophet, apostle, it's not just another title. But rather, it is a calling. Not everyone can be an apostle. Not everyone can be a prophet. Not everyone can be a teacher. It is a calling. So when we look at that English word for apostle, it appeared in 19 verses of the New Testament. The English word apostle, apostles, I'm sorry, plural, not singular, plural, ends up, appears in 59 verses of the New Testament. So let's start breaking it down a little bit farther again to more detail on that word apostle. The Greek word for apostle is apostolos, and according to Strong's D, uh, Greek dictionary, it means a delegate, Specifically, an ambassador of the gospel, officially a commissioner of Christ, with miraculous powers. Apostle, messenger, he that is sent. 
So that is the meaning of the word apostle as it appears in the New Testament. Now, the Greek word itself appears in 80 verses of the New Testament, and it's translated several different ways. The first one is apostolos. That should, uh, let me just go back. Yeah, the Greek word apostolos was translated both apostle and apostles. So it's translated, it's used in the singular and the plural when it's translated into our, our vernacular. It's also translated as the word messengers in 2 Corinthians 8.23 or the singular of it, messenger, in Philippians 2.25. And the apostles themselves are not promised a grand spectacular life. They really are not. People look at the Christian life and they think a lot of times that it's all roses and daisies. But really, that's completely opposite of what Christ told us in the, his word. He said, you shall have tribulation, you shall have persecution. And when we look at the apostles, they are listed right alongside the prophets. Would someone pre please read Luke 11 and 49? Luke 11 49. And Revelation 18 and 20. Revelation 18, 20. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. So, sorry, did I catch you off wrong? No. So, so when we look at the apostles, they are listed right alongside the prophets. And God did not say that they shall have a grand old time and an easy life, but rather that they shall be slayed. Some of them shall be slayed, and they'll be, some of them will be persecuted. So when we look at the life of the apostle and the person of that calling, it wasn't a grand spectacular, um, well, um, this is a great thing, but rather, I'm serving God, it is a calling, persecutions are promised, tribulations are promised, uh, I might lose my life. Those are the promises listed to the apostles, and they are listed right alongside the prophets. And we all know how they treat the Old Testament prophets. It was not very nice. So let's go a little bit farther in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. We find what is known as the Apostles' Doctrine. And I'll go ahead and read that. Acts 2, 42. And they considered... Let me back up to verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added about unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So this is the apostles' doctrine. What is the apostles' doctrine? There's not much really listed in the scriptures. In fact, what you see of the apostles' doctrine can pretty much be found listed in that verse itself. And what's interesting is this. As I was studying, we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what do the heathen claim? Well, our God's resurrected so many years before Jesus Christ ever did, which isn't true because if you start studying their teachings themselves, the resurrection of any God in any mythology does not occur until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, you'll find the resurrection listed in mythology. But nowhere will you find anything like the Apostles' Doctrine listed in any philosopher, any mythology. This is the only location you have it is within the Word of God itself. There is no copying it. There is no duplicating it. There are some references throughout the Word of God to the Apostles' Doctrine where they are referring back to it. One can be found in 2 Peter 3.2. If someone would please read 2 Peter 3 2. So by the commandments of us. Who is the commandments of us? It's the apostles. It's the disciples. We're reading from 
the book, from a book that Peter wrote, who was one of the original 12. So we find that the apostles left teachings for other people to follow. This is the way. Is that completely hard to believe? Absolutely not, because while they had the Old Testament, there were people that got converted that may not have known the Old Testament. In fact, we have Cornelius getting saved and Peter coming back and saying, these Gentiles got saved just like we did. So things got passed down orally. These are the teachings of Jesus Christ. When we look at the life of Christ, did Jesus Christ write down any of his teachings? Not that we're aware of. All everything we have that Christ taught where it was written down by somebody else. His followers. So when we look at the early church, there were many, many things written down because they had the Old Testament. And then we have people like Paul spending three years in, I believe it's Macedonia, not Macedonia. I can't remember exactly where he was. But he spent three years studying the scriptures. Why? Because that led to what we have as what we know as the New Testament. And when it comes down to reading the word of God, if somebody just gets saved, do we point them to the Old Testament and say, start reading in Genesis and work your way up? No. Start in the New Testament. Why? Because it's easier to understand. Because they understood the Old Testament, they understood the teachings of Christ, and made it easier for us to follow. So not a lot of things were written down in the early church, but yet instruction was needed. So where did that come from? It came from the apostles, and it was handed down. Who did Peter go back to when Cornelius got saved? He went back to the headquarters there in Jerusalem, to the apostles, to James, the brother of Jesus. So the apostles handed down teachings for their followers to follow and what exactly were these teachings? If someone would please read Jude chapter 17. Jude 17. But beloved, remember these the words which were spoken before the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did I stop short? In verse 18, I should have went down to. And how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. So when we look at the apostles, one of the very first warnings that they gave to the early church was, watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false teachings. They also went out and say, we're not just of false prophets, but of false apostles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 and 14. Where the Bible reads, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Jesus Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So the early apostles, they were already warning the church, you know, this is the way, but watch out for false prophets. We look at this passage here, they made reference to even Satan himself being transformed into an angel of light. That's something that we can even apply all throughout history. There's always been those that have come behind trying to pervert the word of God, trying to change it quite, trying to twist it. And that's where we get cults coming up from. You know, not everything is inaccurate when it comes to cults and their teaching. Because they take the word of God and twist it just a little bit. It's not a matter that we change everything, but we twist it just a little. And we see that warning given to the early church. Watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. Because even as Satan fell, he was an angel like he looked good, but he did not come spreading a good message. And we also see the same thing in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. Revelation 2, 2. Where the Bible reads, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience 
and how else can thou spare them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found themselves liars? So how could they try those that said they were apostles and found them to be liars? Because they were all they have already been warned far and enough in advance, wash out by false prophets. Wash out for false apostles. And where did they get that heating from? They got it from the apostles themselves. They also gave teaching on end times. If someone would, we've already read that to some degree in Jude. Jude chapter 7, chapter 17. Jude 17, all the way through 19. Where the Bible reads, But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. And take notice of that, in the last time, who should walk after their own godly lusts, who shall these be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit of God. But they gave him teaching concerning the end times. You know what? Be careful. This is what's going to happen. People are going to come out and try to see you just not now, but in the end times. We have even the teaching of the Apostle Paul that we go back to. How do we know that we are living in the end times? Because we are following the teachings of the Apostles. We know that in the end time there's going to be a great falling away. So we've been given warnings from the apostles themselves. When it comes to the apostle doctrine, Paul's life itself adds credit and merit to the apostles' creed itself. If someone would please read Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans 1 and verse 16. So what did Paul say? That his life bears witness of it. Go ahead and read it one more time. I'm a little distracted. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is power unto salvation. So the, the Apostles' Creed, or the doctrine, we really don't have it verbatim. We don't have anything really except for what is stated in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And then we have references leading back. The modern day Apostles' Creed, as we would know it, if you went to a Lutheran church or something like that, it would, probably, it would read as follows. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of saints, the resurrection of the body and of the life everlasting. When we look at that, that is how we would see it printed out today. We do not have that verbatim. But as a side note, there are some references that this has existed, or at least in part, from the very beginning of the church as we know it, because, and they go back to the fact that some of the early church fathers quoted some of this in reference in some of their writings church fathers like Tertullian and Irenaeus. So that was just a little side note. But let's go on with our last 10 minutes and talk about the duties of the apostle. The duties of the apostle. If we would go to Acts chapter 2 verse 43, Acts 2 43, and if someone would please find Acts 5 12. Acts 5 12. But Acts 2.43, of course, that is the verse that proves that comes after the what we refer to as the Apostles' Creed. 
the Bible states this. And they consider, uh, and they, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Does somebody have Acts 5.12? By the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were wrought among the people, and they were all upon the Lord and Solomon and the Lord. So when we look at the duties of the apostles themselves, we see that signs and wonders are to be performed. Are to be performed. Now we do know that that is true of every believer. The Bible says that signs and wonders shall follow them of that belief. But when we look at the early church, we see in Acts 2.43 and Acts 5.12, signs and wonders were performed by the apostles. Acts 4.33 states that this gives evidence of the resurrection of Christ. And I will read that, Acts 4.33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So signs and wonders are performed, are more performed by the apostles, and they gave evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The next thing we want to look at is that they ordained decrees or teachings or ceremonies. Would someone please read Acts chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. Acts 16, 4 and 5. So they ordained decrees and teachings and ceremonies that people follow. And once again, we can see this as a reference going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where the apostles gave uh, doctrine, they gave um, a creed to follow. And then finally, I wanted to look at how do we define an apostles in today's day and age? Because really, when we get down to it, not that I don't want to call it anti-scriptural, but we don't. What we see listed, performed in churches today and throughout the church world, is not always exactly what we see in Scripture. And what I mean by that is, how do we define an apostle nowadays? If we were to think about an apostle, what is the big chief thing that defines an apostle? That's what I would think of. When I think of an apostle, I would think of a church planner. Somebody who goes into an area where there's no Christian church at all, and they start up their own church. Whether it's just with that family or they have somebody else coming from the community, they would be the church starter. But really, when we study scripture, does the office of apostle line up exactly to that? Well, if we study it out, no, because the definition given to the word apostle is an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or a messenger. So, an apostle does not necessarily, have, when we we're looking at the Greek word and looking at it in detail, an apostle, according to the word of God, is not necessarily one who starts a church. In our minds, that is somebody that goes and starts a church. According to the biblical definition that we're looking at, according to Strong's, an evangelist could fall into this category. Are they not an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Are they not a messenger? A pastor could fall into this category. Are they not an ambassador? Are they not a messenger? So it's not, everything we see in the Word of God, I don't want to say it's anti-biblical, but the way we do things now is a little bit different than what they did in the New Testament and the early church. But, and we probably primarily get the idea of an apostle being a church planner from the big apostle that everybody looks to. And who do you think is a big apostle that everybody thinks of when they think of an apostle? Or who comes to mind for you? Who's the one person throughout the New Testament that said, Time and time again, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. Paul. Paul. And it doesn't mean that he's any less than the other ones or any greater, but 
The reason we think of the Apostle Paul is because when we think New Testament, who wrote the majority of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul. So who had more time to get in there that I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle? The Apostle Paul. So we kind of had that drilled in. So when we think of an apostle, we automatically go to the Apostle Paul. And what did the Apostle Paul do? He went on missionary trips and he planted church after church after church. And when we look at the New Testament, that's exactly what we see. Him writing to the different churches to say, this is the way you should go. Do this. And there are times when he says, don't do that. Or get them out. But the Apostle Paul is the one that gave instruction, but he planted so many different churches. So in today's church world, that's probably why we get that connotation of connecting a past, uh, an apostle, with a church plan. And even when it comes to that, that's probably where I would say we get our idea of even apostolic authority as well. What do I mean by apostolic authority? It means I plant a church here. I get a pastor to take over, I move on somewhere else, I start another church, I get another pastor to take over. But again, I have some degree of power over the first church I planted, not whether whether I established it that way, but maybe not necessarily so. Because when we get into people's mindset and their pastors, sometimes, for a lack of better terms, they get a God complex towards that pastor. Do we see that in the Word of God? Absolutely. I'm of the Apostle Paul. No, I'm of Apollos. If we get into the church world, well, I got saved under this pastor, or I got saved under this pastor. And really, in our mind's eye, because we came into the faith under them, we have such, we place them on such a high pedestal in our life because they had such a great influence. So whatever the case would be, whether that apostle or that church planner, whatever you want to call them, build it up so they had apostolic authority over it and stayed in contact and did that, or whether it's because of the people's reverence towards them, I would say it's through the Apostle Paul that we get most of our current mindset of what an apostle is or of what their ministry is through the life of the Apostle Paul. Now with that being said, I am out of time. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add to it? If not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth that the Holy Ghost may have his way, making himself visible if he so chooses, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be plowed, that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives and be transformed in your very image, Lord. And when the song leader and the musicians, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord, give them a special blessing, we pray. Anoint the speaker's lips, Lord, and their mind as they bring forth your word today, Lord. Give them a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Dan, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you.